so Naomi's aware of this. This isn't really a story I'm sharing with her. This is just for the benefit of our listeners. Uh, we celebrated Thanksgiving this week. I don't know when this episode's coming out. It could be like late December or January. It's going to be very funny if that's the case. The whole the whole family was together too. It was great. The whole family was together. Naomi yeah. came down with her significant other. My brother Max was there. My me and Lauren showed up and you know, we we brought our appetites and there was a slight miscommunication about the dessert <laughs> situation. Um, so normally we make a lot of pie and this year Max was like, Hey, I can handle pies. And I'm like, great. I was thinking of doing a banoffee pie. And he was like, yeah, no worries. I'm going to make all these fruit pies. And somewhere in there, there was a miscommunication. And I thought that he was just going to focus on fruit pies, you know, apple and blueberry and pumpkin. And he thought that I was going asking him to make a banoffee pie. When in reality, I wanted to make a banoffee pie. And Wednesday evening, I'm staring at my ingredients and realize I have too much material to fit in one pie crust. So I actually made two banoffee pies. And I show up Thanksgiving Day, and not only has Max made five separate pies and a banoffee pie, I've shown up with two banoffee pies. So we had a total of nine pies for seven people. And listeners, that was a predicament. That was a conundrum, and we are still suffering the sins of that decision. I think it was eight pies, because he made three blueberry, he made a banoffee, he made an apple, he made a... There was a well, pumpkin pie. there's a pecan pie. and a pumpkin. Oh, and a pecan. I made the pecan pie. I totally forgot about the yeah. pecan pie. Yeah, there was nine. Mm -hmm. Holy crap. Yeah, that was a lot of pie. Mom just sent me home with just pie leftovers. It was great. Yeah, I have... A pie and a half in my fridge that I need to do something with. And I'm kind of tempted to... Make an to... ice cream. I was going to feed it to my cats. But no, ice cream sounds like a good idea, too. <laughs> Wait, what kind of pie is it? Is this the banoffee pie? Got a little banoffee, got a little apple, got a little pumpkin, and a thin slice of pecan. Okay, you never, like, took me up on my offer to, like, wrap it up in rice paper, throw it in the air fryer, and call it, like, a new dessert. I feel like that'd be low-key good, because it'd be crispy, and the inside would be gooey, and it'd be warm. And if you had, like, a dipping sauce? It was a nice offer, Naomi, and you're too late. I've done that already. I stole your idea. Here was I am, good? starting a new food truck. No, it was awful, but... You know oh, what? Oh, damn it. <laughs> In innovation takes takes mistakes. Innovation takes failure. Albert Einstein found a thousand ways of exploiting people and not making a light bulb. And I found that if you wrap up pie and rice paper, it's not very good. To why will no one date these pies? Eh, Ooh, eh, good, eh. good one. Um, we are a pie podcast talking about how to bake the best pies to seduce future partners. It turns out mm -hmm. that if you just have the right combination of mints and meat, um, you can pick up practically anyone. Doesn't matter if they're gay, straight, asexual. The right pie is the way into anyone's heart. I'm Joel Guy. Sorry, I'm Joel Pie. I'm Naomi Pie, and this is Why Will No One Eat These Pies? I feel we've yeah. lost. We've lost some energy. Uh, Naomi, lost we're it. back <laughs> once again to talk about Steve Harvey's follow-up to Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man, Straight Talk, No Chaser. Uh, in the last two episodes, Steve has given some really bad advice that's used his own life story to kind of undermine the lessons of um, the the first book and the whole idea of this book was to kind of redeem himself and didn't do a very good job. Uh, in this episode, surprisingly, he's going to do more of the same, but, and this is, this is the crazy part. He's going to sprinkle in some halfway decent love advice. What? And I'm excited to get to that. Yeah. Uh, before we jump in though, I do have a Jones soda for today. I have Jones cream soda, uh, Lauren is a cream soda fiend, and she says Ooh. this is very good, so I am excited. I have not actually consumed any. I poured myself a small measure and handed her the rest of the bottle. Um, so let's see how it tastes. Not bad. Pretty good. I'm I'm happy. Tastes like cream. Tastes like soda. Um, 
no real artificial flavors there. I mean, there probably are, but it doesn't taste like artificial chemically. It's it's pretty good. I'd recommend it. Well done, Jones. You redeemed yourself after the atomic blue fizzy lemonade or whatever. Anything to discuss? Or can we just jump back in, Naomi? No, let's jump back in. Okie dokie. Okay, so we get into chapter four, which we're not going to spend much time on because chapter four is titled Every Sugar Daddy Ain't Sweet. The big insight Steve Harvey gives people in this chapter is that, and this is going to shock you, Naomi, some sugar daddies are not interested in long-term or serious relationships. Can you believe that? Oh my god, I had no idea that men that were trading sex for money or um, <laughs> companionship for money would want not want a long-term relationship. Yeah, um, I don't, this feels honestly like a waste of space. I don't know anyone who's like, oh, the sugar daddy really loves me. Um, that doesn't feel like a common thing people believe. Uh, but there is one section of note here that I wanted to discuss, and I'm just going to paste that for you. I've got plenty of friends who've played Sugar Daddy more times than they're willing to cop to. Never heard that as a saying. One of my boys had a fleet of gorgeous women he flew all around the country. He'd buy them things to keep them interested and have them coming and going as if he was running air traffic control at LAX. That's a good one. Arrival and departure times, that's all he cared about. I personally saw the doorman who controlled entry into his building, high-five him one evening and say, sir, I'm enjoying your visits. He did nothing for those women. He didn't profess any love for them. He didn't take them to meet his family. There was no coming over to his house unannounced, and they weren't invited into his life to share it with him. He was just offering up sponsorship packages. So Steve knows a lot of not great human beings, and like Dr. Phil, he doesn't do anything about it. Um, I guess you could argue that as a famous person who's well-traveled, Steve just runs into more people than average, but he also refers to these people as close friends, so that's something to ponder. Um, I guess my problem here is not, oh, Steve Harvey is like totally fine with cheating. It's that he specifically talked about women looking for men who could provide for them in prior chapters. And how it's important to find yourself a man who can provide for you. And my problem is, if so many successful people, per Steve, use their money to support having multiple girlfriends, wouldn't the ideal man who's loyal to a woman be someone who didn't have a lot of resources because they couldn't afford to hold down multiple girlfriends simultaneously? Or is Steve just saying that this is natural for wealthy people? That this is like what all wealthy people are going to do, implying that cheating isn't so bad after all? Because he certainly doesn't seem to think it's a relationship deal breaker. He doesn't say that cheat. He doesn't say cheating in any of this. Like, is there context behind this that he, this man, was cheating on his wife or something? Because to me, this is just this is a sugar daddy situation. Okay, I think the reason I jumped to this conclusion was because of the next section that he talks about okay feel free to read that let me know what you think okay in my line of business i see this all the time men with means celebrities athletes bankers businessmen have one two three or even more women on the side and each one of them will be the proud recipient of a sponsorship package okay i get what you're saying now it just needed more context they might get two thousand dollars for rent in a luxurious condo maybe seven hundred dollars for a car note three hundred dollars for hair and nail appointments an expensive pair of shoes or dress every now and then again that uh, tally that up and those women have gotten something very valuable from their sugar daddies haven't they they have a place to live and transportation and they get to look good from head to toe all on someone else's dime but what they've what they're getting from their sponsors is worth nothing more than a dime to a sugar daddy in the scheme of things. If he's making millions, what is what is that little $3,000 a month costing him? The woman who's getting that sponsorship package is worth very little. The equivalent of a withdrawal of cash mere mokalani socks. Cashmere mokalani. That's one word. Joel, that's one word. Cashmere mokal. How do you say that? Marco Liani of socks? cashmere Marco Liani. I think it's a brand. Okay. Very, a few fancy Hermes ties and a pair of expensive cufflinks. He might as well be flipping a quarter in her direction. So yeah, that's why I'm thinking he's like, when I say sugar daddy, I really mean like cheating on your partner and having people in other cities. Yeah. And I think it's also interesting that his problem is not 
oh, these people are cheating on their wives. It's that they're not spending enough money on the people they're cheating on their wives with. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It, it's just weird. I, I, I've mentioned before, and this is going to come up a little bit later, that it feels, again, like multiple people wrote this book, and the lessons are all kind of over the place. Because, like, he gives women a lot of advice for how to detect if, like, men are committed, and then also it says, like, oh, yeah, I know all these guys who aren't committed because they have all these resources. They don't have to be committed. They could do whatever they want. And I was like, okay, well, how do you detect a man who, like, has lots of resources that he exclusively wants to spend on you? Or should you just accept that, like, men are inevitably going to cheat? I don't know. It, it, it's it's weird. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But we don't need to linger too much on it. I just thought it was worth remarking on. Um, So, let's talk about a conundrum, Naomi. Chapter 5 is titled, The Standoff. He won't commit. You won't leave. Now what? So Naomi, you've been dating a guy for a while and he hasn't proposed yet. What are you what are you gonna do? I'm going to probably break up with him because if I want to get serious and he doesn't, then that means that our life goals are different. If he's willing to propose in the future, I think that's a further conversation. But I think that if that person is not, you know, on the same, you know, timeline as you, I think that says a lot about your relationship. Yeah, that's fair. Um, Steve is interesting because he says that the situation is becoming more common these days. He notes that more and more people are living together without getting married. And he almost doesn't even put a value judgment on it. He basically says men make commitments only when the consequences for not doing so are clear. Basically, you know, men commit to show up to work on time every day because they know they can be fired if they don't. Right. And so he's like the way to get your man to settle down with you, the way to get him to commit is to set clear conditions upon the relationship. And then he goes off on a tear about like the power of women. And I'm wondering about your thoughts on this. Call me a hopeless romantic, but I honestly believe your man is out there and that getting into a solid, stable, loving relationship is still possible. Here's the rub. Binding that commitment begins and ends with you. I know, I know. This place... This places the responsibility squarely in your lap, but the reality is that women truly hold the power in their pretty, delicate, manicured hands. I said it in Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man, but it bears repeating. A man can't hold a conversation with you, kiss you, hold your hand, call your house, take you out, or pull back the sheets on your bed, except with your permission, period. Think about it. A man can't run for president if he doesn't have a wife. Other men aren't about to let some guy have all the power and have a nation of women, even their own, looking wistfully at a single president. And we all know full well that women bring all kinds of necessary nuances to the Oval Office. Look at recent events. A man who cheats on his wife and has a baby out of wedlock can't run for the presidency because his character is now in question. Both women, his wife and his lover, hold the power to keep him for the most powerful seat in the land. Which president is he speaking of? Or presidential candidate? I don't really know the early 2000s presidential primary drama too well. I think this might be a John Edwards reference. Um, but then in the text that like I cut out, he also discusses like a governor having a scandal and recently having to depart. And I didn't bother digging in. It's like, sure, whatever, Steve. I guess this happens sometimes. Okay, moving on. If we have children together, the law almost always allows you to keep keep them over us hell you can't have those babies without we can't we can't have those babies without you that's power women help us curb our worst instincts you're like our built-in moral compass keeping us sane and out of um out of a life of ridiculous drunken debauchery all too many of us would be out of control frat boys acting like a fool all day every day with the sum of the next 30 years We'd spend every single cent we'd have on strippers and hookers, get drunk and stupid, and do entirely inappropriate things every second of the day. If it weren't for our love and respect for our women and our deep faith in us, keeping us in check. That's power. Um, again, I guess it's worth commenting on that he doesn't have a high opinion of men. Like, he said exactly the same thing in Act Like a Lady, where he's like, we'd all be going to Vegas and smoking cigars and eating cold cuts at our Lazy Boys. And I'm like, I can think of groups of men who don't do any of this, right? You've had monks living in abbeys for thousands of years. Now, are some of these monks, you know, closeted gay people who, you know, go off and have sex with their fellow monks? Sure, but I wouldn't call that like wild and crazy and debaucherous. That just seems like 
normal horny people. Um, but yeah, like this idea that women are somehow like God controlling the morality of men is just deeply depressing. It's like men could not be faithful, men could not be committed, men could not care about society without having a woman to regulate their worst impulses. God. No, I think it's stupid because it puts all the like <clears throat> blame in women's hands. Like, oh, it's basically just saying, oh, if a man cheats on you, then that means that you weren't like holding your man down right. And like that means that you weren't acting in the correct yeah. way and stuff. And so it puts like it's taking the blame out of the man's hands if he acts out and puts it in the woman's hands. I see what he's doing here. Like it makes plenty of sense. Yeah. It makes plenty of sense for his argument, but it's frustrating that this is, you know, the idea that he's perpetuating. Oh, for um, sure. Yeah. I don't know. So this first paragraph, the first paragraph that he says is that, like, you have all the control in the relationship. And I'm highly skeptical of that because of a little thing called consent. Ooh. And it's interesting, too, that he's talking about this in 2013, which was, I think, either in the middle of or near the start of ongoing conversations about sexual assault on campus and, like, how colleges weren't doing enough to, like, protect their students from, like, serial rapists and abusers. And, like, I'm not saying that that's necessarily a reflection of all of society, but it certainly feels that in certain segments of society, women do not have control and men do not respect them. And I'm sure he'd be like, well, you know, some men who aren't really men do this. But it's like, dude, sexual assault happens to a shockingly high percentage of women. It really feels like you need to carve that out and explain why that happens if women indeed have all the power in relationships. Yeah, this is, like you said uh, in the last couple of episodes, it's like they, they aren't a true, there isn't a way of testing this. And so it's like, it's so vague that it, at everything that he says is correct. You know what I mean? So it's, it's vague in the best ways for the sake of his argument. And it almost, now reading this again in the context of what we just said, and I was like, this is almost victim blamey. It's like, if a man kisses you without your permission, actually, you gave him permission. He wouldn't yeah. have kissed you if you hadn't been, you know, receptive to his kisses. And it's like, come on, Steve, come on. I know you're a serial philanderer, but you should respect that, like, women sometimes don't have the ability to easily say no or avoid situations that men put them in. Um, kind of gross, dude. But, you know, you're a guy in your 60s, so maybe, again, you're not the best source of advice for, you know, relationships and all the crazy nuance that comes with them. Uh, let's talk about politics, Naomi. What do you think about okay. this idea that men can't run for president if they, you know, have, like, a, a side piece? <laughs> Okay, so I think this is really dumb because um, multiple reasons. The first reason is our last president, and he had three baby mamas at the point of his presidency and the point where he was elected. The second is, oh, along with a variety of, of extramarital affairs, the second is the vast majority of people will not vote for a president who does not have a family slash familial values. So if he is not at least married, it doesn't matter if he has kids. I mean, you'll pull higher if he has kids and he like acts like a good father, but they will not vote for a man who's not married. The third thing is, I think this is dumb because the vast majority of presidents that we have had have cheated on their wives while in the Oval Office. I don't know about vast majority, but I can think of, you know, several off the top of my head. I agree with you. Um, I mean, we're, we're coming, you know, we're, we're 20 years out, 15 years out when he's writing this book from the Clinton administration. And Bill Clinton was like the perfect example that showed presidents are still available to normal people as long as like they're in a position where they can catch their eye. And it's like, yeah, this was like all the talk in media at the time that like Bill Clinton cheated on his wife. So that's not proof that like presidents who have wives are inaccessible to the general public. It means that like you have to work a little bit harder. And, and I think, you know, there's there's something to be said about 
all these think pieces, all these articles that, you know, come out every presidency about like how attractive the presidents are. Like, I don't know if you remember all the pieces about like how like sexy Obama was or, you know, how, how attractive even George Bush was. Um, and, and like, you can disagree, you know, okay, maybe the majority of people don't think that he was attractive, but I think it's easy to argue that like people who agree with your politics, who think you're doing a good job are more likely to find you attractive than, you know, people who aren't and more likely to ignore, you know, the bad decisions you make. And potentially that means they find you like, you know, attractive, but yeah, you have Trump here and I'm not going to blame Steve for, you know, not predicting Trump. Trump kind of blew up a lot of like ideas about politics, but like, I think, again, it's proof that Steve does not have a good grasp on like what the general public expects from their leaders. You have this philandering, incredibly accused serial rapist whose wife like rarely would allow him to hold his hand in public. And here he is. And you see all these videos of like women fawning over him at Trump events. Have you seen these like women in their 60s and all of them have like spray tans and bleached hair and they're just like going goo goo for Trump? Yeah, power attracts a certain subset of people. There's always going to be people who are like, regardless whether or not this person is married, I'm attracted to them. So I don't know why he's like, oh, men would find, you know, presidents who who have wives to be less intimidating when it's like, no, any person who's president is going to be attractive to a subset of people. I don't know, man. I think this is really dumb. And I think we should move on from this because it makes no sense in this day and age. No, okay. Uh, I did just want to touch upon the fact that he's saying that like women have all the control in family courts. And I did just want to reiterate our conversation for why women deserve less. Um, Most cases are settled outside of court, and in those cases, dads just don't want their kids. They don't fight for their kids. Of the minority of cases that are settled in court, dads relinquish their rights voluntarily in many cases, and then in a lot of other cases are unable to prove basic competency either about their kids or about raising kids. And Steve is the person who's like, women have nothing to teach their sons, But also, you'd think that some of the skills women know, like keeping a house together and cooking and cleaning, would be helpful skills for a a, a husband trying to get, like, control of his kids. Um, I mean, imagine Steve in court trying to get parental rights to his 13-year-old daughter, and he admits that he's only spoken to her once by himself in his entire life, right? That's not an easy argument to make if you're following the advice of Steve. Yeah, um, I'm still pondering over that last episode about how he was like, yeah, I've only talked to her like a one on one like once. And it was like when I took her out to lunch and I was like, wow, I know nothing about her. (laughs) I learned today some little girls think about marriage a lot. Oh, really insightful, Steve. Damn, you've really <laughs> you've really done some introspection about your relationship with your daughter. Um, but also keep in mind the last chapter was him describing men he knows, good friends he describes, who are like married, who have partners, and he describes having like multiple women on the side. Like he uses the word side pieces. And I'm like, so women actually are not a controlling influence if they are incredibly wealthy people who go out and have like 15 side pieces around the country. So I don't think it's good advice that marriage like humanizes men. If anything, you've just disproven that with once again, your own life experience. Anything else? Or can we get to the advice he gives about how to get a, get a man to commit? No, let's move on. Okay. Naomi, he has two pieces of advice for how to get a man to commit to you. And then he's going to give you some like other rules. I don't really know how those fit in, but there's two pieces of advice. The first one is you have to get yourself ready for commitment. Are you ready for commitment, Naomi? Oh, God, I'm, I'm kind of worried about what he's going to say about commitment. <laughs> oh, brother. Uh, this is a long section. If you feel if you feel like you want to. Stop at any point and discuss. Let me know. But it's all good. It's all good. I'll never forget the lesson. (laughs) I'll never forget the lesson. My mother taught me about getting ready for a blessing. I was living with my parents, trying to find my way and preparing myself for big things. In this particular instance, a new car. My old car was sitting under a cin- um, uh, sitting up on cinder blocks in my parents' driveway, and I've been saving up my money and checking car dealerships and want ads all around town, looking for some for a more polished ride. One morning, while we were enjoying breakfast together, I said, "Mama, I've been working really hard. I'm going to get a new car." Seeking out support. Uh, seeking out support. At first, she didn't say anything; just nodded, and then she reminded me, "Your old car is out there on the bro- blocks." 
A few days later, I announced to her my intentions again and again, and she nodded and repeated what seemed obvious. Your old car is out there on blocks. For the fourth time she had said it to me, I confronted her. Mama, how, co how come every time I say I want a new car, you tell me about my old one? She was quiet at first, and then she let me have it. If God gives you a new car, where are you going to put it? Your old car is out there on blocks. If you're going to ask God for something, act like he's going to give it to you and be ready to receive it. And you know what? She, what she said made all the sense in the world. I wasn't ready for a new car because my old one was taking up space out there in the driveway. Like trash. I call one of my partners and I paid him $25 to tow that car away. Then I hosed off the concrete and put down some new asphalt and cleared out those blocks and got that driveway ready for my new ride. Two months later, I drove my new car onto that nice clean driveway and thanked God for my blessing. Finally, I was ready to receive it. I share this metaphor with you because it symbolizes what women who truly are looking for a committed relationship must do to get ready for that blessing. You can't get the man you want if you got all your garbage, all that baggage from the last guy who did you wrong, an ex who well, you won't let go of in your figurative driveway up on those blocks. You simply have no room in your heart if a, the guy you keep dating, even though you know he's not the one for you, is hanging around. You may touch each other every once in a while and do things to make each other feel good. That was disgustingly icky, the way he <laughs> described that. But on balance, you're lonely, and he's not there for you when you need him, and you know that relationship isn't going anywhere. He's like that old car up there on those blocks taking up space. The same is true of things that block your heart and your mind from being able from being available to someone new. Divorce, bitterness over the relationship gone wrong, holding on to the myth that all the good guys are taken, thinking it's best to have a deep bench of guys to play with rather than focusing on making one relationship work. Each of these things keep your heart up on those blocks. Makes you think makes you seek out the new guy all the makes you seek out in the new guy all the mistakes and screw ups that ended the last relationship. Hold on to the bitterness, embrace yourself for something bad when you should be focused on finding something good. You got to stop looking for all the signs that the new man is going to hurt you. Stop messing around with the guy who's just wasting your time. Stop holding on to hurt and anger and resentment that came from your divorce. Call the tow truck and haul the mess out of there and get ready to receive the man who is worthy of you. Okay. I'm going to comment on this first because honestly, I think this is <laughs> the best advice I've heard out of him. If I'm being completely honest, I think this is good advice. So often I see my friends and they're in situations where they're like, oh, I need the love of my life. I'm waiting for him. I'm ready to get married. I'm ready to have kids, blah, blah, blah. And all too often, I see them still hung up on their exes. And I see them still putting energy into things that do not deserve their energy. And it's like, yeah, give it time and like wait until you're ready to be in that committed relationship. Don't be holding on to the past while you're trying to get into this new fresh relationship. I think the way he went about it was a bit weird. Touching each other was weird. Yeah. That comment was weird. But otherwise, <laughs> I think this is like the best advice I've heard Steve Harvey give. I have mixed feelings because okay. I think the core of what he's saying is valid. I agree with you. I don't think it's bad advice to say it's difficult to start new relationships if you have baggage from your past. I think that's a good pearl, and I think it's surrounded by like an oyster made of poop. It's it's <laughs> not good framing for this. Um, so my problem here is this is advice from the book The Secret. This is advice that's basically the law of attraction. This is prosperity gospel shit. This is what grifters try to sell people. The idea that if you just like manifest and think the right thoughts and like focus really intently on getting what you want, everything good will come to you. And if you don't think positively, you deserve what's coming to you. He specifically says, and I highlighted that in the section, you need to lower your standards. You've got to stop looking for all the signs that a new man is going to hurt you. And I, I could not agree uh, sorry, could not disagree stronger with that, right? <laughs> That's the advice that gets people abused, right? That makes people put up with stuff they shouldn't. People who read this and think, oh, that's not bad advice, probably use this framing as well to evaluate the relationships of their friends and family, which seems really toxic, right? Because they're looking at this and they're internalizing the idea that if their friends and family aren't happy, they're unhappy because they haven't finished processing the hurt they had from their last relationship. Not because they're in a shitty relationship with a new partner, 
Not because, you know, they have all these problems at work and they don't have any money and, you know, the kids are crying at night and all that stuff. It's because they haven't finished processing the hurt they had from their last relationship. I don't like that. Again, I agree with you. The core here is good, but the way he talks about it is just really toxic. I think it's also just the way that you, um, like, everybody takes in advice and, um, I don't know a good way of saying this. They think about it differently and they conceptualize it differently. And so I think that you may be looking at this from a negative POV and being like, oh yeah, this advice sucks. But the way that I took that, like, yes, it can be bad. The the highlighted section that you that you talked about and let me just reread that for the um, audience you've got to stop looking for all the signs that the new man is going to hurt you i totally understand what he's saying and i think that you just perceived it differently than i did so i think this is down to just perception because again he's being so vague that anything that he says is correct and you can't like speak against it so i see that as okay i think you've got to stop looking for all the signs that a new man is going to hurt you. Yeah, you don't want to like bring your old hurt into new relationships. Like all too often I see situations where women are like, oh, this man is obviously going to hurt me. So I'm not going to um, like open up my, this is going to sound really disgusting when I say it. I'm not going to open up my heart again for a new person because he's obviously just like the last one. Yeah. I mean, I guess my issue is in the context of the chapter as a whole, he starts a chapter and says, let's talk about how to get a man to commit. And his first like answer is, well, maybe you haven't allowed yourself to be manipulated enough. Maybe you still have too high of standards if your man hasn't committed. Th- that's where I'm coming from here. Okay. And, and, and okay. I, I get where you're coming from, where like you could read different things into this, but it's concerning that like he's written two separate books about like the advice he thinks is essential for relationships, and there's still enough ambiguity that people can like take away completely different ideas. That's because he's going to write a third book. Oh. Yeah. Seriously, guys, you. women, you're too dumb. I can't believe I had to write this. This is book three, Steve Harvey, straight talk, gay people don't exist. That's a really long title, Joel. I think he he needs to cut that. Maybe. Yeah, it needs to be four words. (laughs) That's the attention span (laughs) of his audience. Okay, so his second piece of advice about how to get men to commit is to build a fence around your heart. And this is a long bit and he doesn't say a lot, so I'll summarize it. Basically, he says you can't have incredibly high standards like a 20-foot fence around your heart because no one will ever be able to climb that 20-foot fence. You can have some standards, he says, like a 4-foot fence around your heart, but not too many. So an example he gives is that he was on Oprah talking about the Act Like a Lady book, and a lady asked him some questions during the Q&A period. And she told him, I don't know if this is true, but she told him she had 236 separate standards that men had to reach to date her. And he's looking at her and he's like, why would a six foot four guy with washboard abs who's in the gym every week? And I guess those were like the standards that she, you know, gave. I don't think Steve Harvey has washboard abs. Why would a six foot four guy with washboard abs in the gym every week want to date someone like you, the question asker, who's short? who's stocky and looks like she eats smothered pork chops for every meal. And again, I'm not saying this is horrible advice. I just feel the framing is really bad, right? It's kind of rude. And I think the better advice is that I think people will be attracted to all manner of things. I think there's plenty of examples of like really jacked fitness guys who have like kind of plump girlfriends. That's, you know, totally acceptable. No one's, you know, coming after them. It's not crazy to say that like there's someone out there for everyone, but I concede that if you have super high standards, it'll be harder to find someone. I think the better advice here is not to be like, hey, fatty, put down the smothered pork chops. It's to say people are more likely to be attracted to people whose lifestyles match their own. There's less work involved in fusing your life and friend circles together with another person when there's symmetry between the things that you do. That doesn't mean like you need to have identical lifestyles, but if ladies want a super jacked guy... It's easier to get a super jacked guy if you're also super into fitness and committed to the lifestyle of the gym. It's not impossible to get one otherwise, but you'll save yourself a lot of work if you're in those circles doing those things. In the same way, I don't think this advice is specific to women. I think it applies to men as well. 
who, as we discussed in the Why Women Deserve Less book, think that all women are 50 pounds lighter than their actual average weight and don't seem to know how many blondes are out there. Um, like, like men are like, oh, the most attractive hair color is blonde. And then you look and I think it's like 16% of the women population actually has blonde hair. Um, most men would probably like, you know, a gamer girl of their dreams who, you know, has watched all of their Marvel movies and, you know, they, they can talk shop about Halo all day. But then they would probably have to, and this is going to sound crazy to me, lower their standards and accept that someone who plays video games a lot, who's more likely to fit into their lifestyle and be able to talk with them about the things they're passionate about, is probably less likely to be a size zero model than someone who weighs the statistical average of women. Does that seem fair? That seems completely fair. Yeah, so again, I'm not saying that the advice Steve is offering here is inherently bad. I think it's fair to say if you have an insane list of standards, it's going to be harder to find someone than it is if you lower your standards and find, like, specific things that are important to you. But the way he packages it, again, is like, that lady's fat because she eats smothered pork chops. It's like, Come on, bud. Come on. What What is a smothered pork chop? Is a pork chop, is that a smothered pork chop just a pork chop that has like onions and mushrooms, like sauteed onions and mushrooms on top of it? I think so. It looks like mushrooms are a big component. Okay. Uh, pan fried pork chops and an onion and mushroom gravy. Ooh. Now I want some pretty smothered good. pork chops. Yeah. Yeah. Forget the gym. <laughs> There's smothered pork chops to be eaten. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so I've had some criticisms of, like, these last two sections because I'm like, okay, Steve, this isn't horrendous advice, but the way you're packaging it's kind of toxic, and I think people are going to take it the wrong way. And I want to reiterate that we get to this weird point where it seems, once again, the book is written by multiple people because the advice suddenly gets good in these next following sections. Not great, but at least, like, a bare minimum good. So okay. he's like, hey... You, you've 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 done these two things. You've cleared out your heart. You've gotten rid of all the hurt in your relationship. Um, you've you've lowered your standards. Now you need to reconsider why you want to stay with him. And I'm like, holy shit, Steve, that's actually a really insightful thing to say. So he has five things that you need to consider if you think you're going to stay with this guy. Okay. One, if you're staying with him because of the kids, I commend you for this. It's a noble gesture. No kid should... Sorry. No child should have to grow up without a father in the home. Mm. And it's a natural part of your nurturing instinct to want your kids to stay in an intact household if it's an option. There's a value to that. But what value does your child get when he sees his mother is miserable all the time? Who wins if you're doing all the cooking, all the cleaning and child rearing, making all the effort and getting back more than you share in, of misery and, and frustration? And you're not getting what you want and need in return. Is it win-win if your child doesn't know what love and respect looks like? I've even heard women say that for all the sake of their children, they're simply going to stick it out in their relationship arrangements until their child graduates from school, and then they'll leave. That's a mighty long time to wait for happiness, and that's why they have to have they ha what that's why they have this thing called visitation you should look into that and then make plans to get happy particularly if he's the type who's never going to give you the commitment you need not bad not bad steve i don't like the comment about like no child having to grow up without a father but like yeah besides but that <laughs> same time he left his first wife and he his, <laughs> they had a child together mm-hmm yeah, he's speaking from experience. This is the thing he can talk about with authority, Naomi. <laughs> but also he's talking about like, he's like, who wins if you're doing all the cooking, all the cleaning, all the child rearing and making all the effort and making and getting back more than your share of misery or frustration. He literally talks about in his first book, like he talks about how that's the role of the woman in the household and how men are just there to bring in the like the 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 bread. Yeah, I, I did think this is weird because he said before that, you know, he respects women for like keeping down the household, but he's also like, you know, well, men do important things like, you know, fixing the mailbox and changing your car oil. And here again, feels like a completely different person being like, no, the important stuff is the stuff women do. And if they're not getting respect and women and children aren't seeing that their mothers are treated with respect, the relationship isn't worth salvaging. Right. There seems to be a, a tonal juxtaposition there. Yeah. But yeah, no, I, I think saying, hey, women, cut your losses. Don't teach your kids to put up with shit is good advice. I'm with you. 
I, again, find a little weird that he's like, fathers are essential, because outside of like teaching your kids how to shake their dicks after they pee, I don't really know what fathers are teaching their kids. But um, no, no, no problems really with this. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm fine with this advice, Steve. What about number two, Naomi? If you're staying with him, hoping that he'll eventually give you a ring. Knowing that the ring's not coming, you've been with him for how long and he still hasn't asked you, he's still making excuses and promises, and he never wants to talk about taking the next step, he tells you he's not ready, those are all signs that you're holding on to the hope that's absolutely hopeless. He's not marrying you because he, you're not telling him it's mandatory in order for the two of you to continue. Why should he? He says he loves you. You've had his children. He's grateful for his babies. You're sleeping with him. You told him what you hold him when he's sad. His family already accepts you and you're going to the office parties. He's got all the benefits of the marriage. In his mind, there's no compelling reason to get married. You're the one who wants the wedding. He doesn't. And until you make it a requirement, he won't. In this economy... Sorry. In esta economic. <laughs> no, this, this is interesting because like this is the first time I've been like, oh, telling women to take responsibility over their relationship makes a lot of sense. And this feels like completely different framing than what he's done before. I don't know exactly what he's saying here that's so different, but saying men aren't going to commit if they're getting all the benefits of a relationship and have no obligation to put a ring on your finger makes a lot of sense to me. And if it's a priority for women and men aren't willing to follow through on it, again, he's saying cut your losses. And I'm like, ah, oh, interesting. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. Three, if you're staying because the sex is good. If, if he's touching you good. <laughs> Ew, that was so gross the way he said that. He sounded like an eight-year-old man that was like a monk his entire life. If you're staying because the sex is good, fireworks at night will leave you feeling nothing but empty and alone in the morning. Countless women will tell you in a heartbeat, I can't bear him. He's not doing this. He's not doing that. But girl, all the lights swirl and the stars pop in the sky when I'm in bed with him. His physical prowess is so outstanding. That moment of gratification is so addictive. All his negatives are overlooked up for a moment of sexually charged excitement. But let me clue... Let me clue you in on a little something. He's not the only one who can satisfy you. If you really want to experience something incredible, find a man who treats you the way you deserve to be treated, a man who adores you the way you deserve to be adored, and gives you your heart's desire. See how that feels. Tell, uh, Talk about, oh, say, can you see, and the bombs bursting in the air. You're diminishing your, ch you're diminishing your chances of getting true gratification as long as you keep messing around with the wrong one. Eh, not bad advice. I think he's overestimating the number of men who know where to, what and where a clitoris is, but... Uh. I think that that's completely plausible. I also think that this is good advice because the vast majority of people stay in relationships because they think they know what good sex is. And until they, like, own a vibrator and they have really good sex, um, I don't think they know what good sex is. Yeah, and, and I like this, too, because there's been this undercurrent. I don't think Steve Harvey has been, like, explicitly slut-shaming people, but he's definitely been like, you need to keep your legs closed until you're convinced, like, a guy's the one. And here yeah. he's like, women like having sex. Women enjoy having orgasms. And I'm like, whoa, Steve, that's so crazy. It's incredible. It took you two books to get to that point. <laughs> But he's like, no, you know, sometimes women make bad decisions, like, fall, like you know, how sometimes men follow their dicks, sometimes women follow their uteruses, and, you know, that's not great. You know, there's other people out there who know how to do sex. There's other people out there that you can teach to give you the sex that you want. Don't stick around because a guy, you know, can, can make you orgasm. That's not a good reason. There's other things to care about. And again, I'm like, okay, no, that's, that's totally fair, Steve. No, no problems with that. Four, if you're staying because the money is right, now that you're selling your happiness to the highest bidder, let's say he's the primary breadwinner, he makes more than you or his half is essential to upholding the lifestyle you're accustomed to and have come to love, you're going to take it, you're going to take a hit if you leave. You go, may go from a mansion to an apartment, from a luxury car to a used sedan, from an expendable income to a scenario where you're closer to living paycheck to paycheck. But isn't that worth your happiness? Can you put a price tag on what your happiness is worth? What's the cost? Is it worth $36,000 a year, $100,000, $1 million? Are the big house, the two extra cars, and the shopping sprees at the fancy stores worth the misery? 
You may lose financially if you walk away, but what you gain is happiness, peace of mind, and self-esteem is priceless. I like this advice. I'm not opposed to this advice. I, I just think it could use a little more elaboration. Um, I, I think, you know, he's given examples in the prior books and even in this book of women who stay in relationships with sugar daddies because the sugar daddies are helping them cover, you know, basic household expenses. And I think, unfortunately, in esta economica, there's a lot of people who may stay in relationships that aren't great because they have financial security to, you know, continue paying rent or because, you know, they need someone to help them pay tuition at their kids' schools or something. And, and so I think it's a little more complicated than what he's talking about. I think he's right that like you're selling your happiness to the highest bidder. But in many cases, I think the highest bidder is providing the things you need to not worry about, you know, all the problems that you have to afford in your life. And so he's right, but I think it's not as easy as he makes it out to be. There's a lot of people who are financially dependent and they're not OK with it, but they're fine with it because they don't really have a lot of other options. Yeah, I would agree, especially especially since he wrote this book almost, I, I think he said it was 2013 we wrote this, he t- wrote this 10 years ago, so everybody was in a completely different financial situation. So, I don't know. I, mm, mm. Well, no, because remember, uh, he wrote this book in the aftermath of the financial crisis. So, like, maybe things were getting a bit better, but, like, they still were not great. He's yeah, already but Joel, given we're it. in a silent recession right now. Anything is better than this. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go um, become one of Bill Gates' harem. Yeah, I want to talk about like the fa- the inflation difference between 2013 and 2023. That's obviously a lot different. And yes, I will definitely agree that I will become a part of his harem as well. Be willing to cash in your chips. Once you consider all of the proceeding, once you think logically about how illogical it is to hold on to a man who refuses to give you what you want, you're going to have to take that brave step and stop gambling with your life because that's all you're doing. You're going from table to table, winning some and losing some, collecting chips before giving them up. This ain't Vegas, baby. What happens here stays with you for the rest of your life. Getting married is more than just the pretty wedding gown and the flavor of cake you'll serve, deciding who will be in the wedding party and the size of the stone in the ring. A lot of rights comes with that place of piece of paper that says you are legally bound to this man. If something happens to the husband, the job, the social security will pay benefits to his wife and the children. If he gets sick and medical decisions need to be made at the hospital, a girlfriend doesn't have any decision-making power. Common law exceptions, none. Non, notwithstanding no matter how long he's she's been with her man no matter how long they've talked about what his wishes would be were he ever in the position where life and death decisions had to be made a wife has that power if a man decides to break up with a woman who's been in a long-term relationship with him and helped him build his wealth the ex-girlfriend has no claim on the money they accumulated together but if she got married pa- she's got marriage papers she gets half not always um I, I understand where he's coming from. Yes. And again, I feel this is like a good articulation of why marriage is important. Before, he's kind of just been like, well, God wants you to be together. I'm a Christian and God's going to cry a little if you don't settle down. But here it's like, no, there are actually genuinely good reasons, right? You know, if someone dies in the workplace, you know, I don't know what the exact rules are, but I'm going to assume a wife has more rights to, you know, whatever uh, you know, f- money he gets from, you know, I-, I forget what the accident fund is, but yeah, there's like federal payments for, you know, people who die on the job, you know, social security payouts, tax benefits, legal decisions, even, you know, healthcare benefits. It's it's really important to be married. And I like this articulation here where he's like, look, you know, um, d- women <laughs> have a good reason for asking their husband or their, their partner to marry them. It's not unreasonable to make this argument. And I feel here there are some good arguments to give your potential husband about why it's so important for you to settle down. No, I completely agree. I think that all of these are good reasons. I wouldn't say that they're like, he does get into the fact that a lot of women are looking for a wedding. They're not looking necessarily for a marriage. Okay. I, that's a generalization. I shouldn't say that. Some people look for the wedding and don't look for the marriage when they are thinking about getting married. And so I think that that's a good point to bring up. And I think that 
also talking about the fact that, oh, if he, you guys don't get married and he's not willing to get serious, who's going to be making his medical decisions? That's a good point that nobody really ever brings up in these discussions. It's like, okay, let's just yeah. say he gets in a car accident who, you know, knows about his DNR and who, you know, can make those decisions of like pulling the plug. I don't even know, like, Joel, let's just say before you and Lauren get married, who would be making those, de- would, like, would mom be able to make those decisions? That's a good question. Yeah, I don't know the legal framework, but I think it is family members. Okay. Unless maybe there's a will. Yeah, I don't know enough about like medical resuscitation orders, who has power of, not attorney, attorney. power of physician. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, that's not an area <laughs> I can talk about. Yeah. And, and I think it's good because he's like, look, you know, I understand there are some places where common law marriages are like totally valid, but he's also right. There's a lot of places they're not valid and you need to be yeah. considerate of that. Okay, so we have one last section, and this is where we're going to wrap up today. He gives 12 commandments. These are ways to tell if your man is ready to commit. 12 ways to tell if your man is ready to commit. Number one, he takes you to his place of worship. No godless heathens worthy of marriage in Steve's world. Oh, that's my comment. (laughs) Uh Oh, I was like, what? (laughs) (laughs) No, I I thought it was... I don't like this. We've talked about this before, but yeah, I'm like, atheists can be good partners, Steve. People who don't worship routinely can be good partners, Steve. There's lots of people who are worthy of the love of God, worthy of relationships who don't go. And then there are plenty of people who go to church every week and like molest their kids. So like this should not be a good way to like tell if someone's a good partner. I saw this podcast host, like, one of those, like, misogynist podcast hosts talking about, like, how he won't let his future wife go to church alone, even when he's, like, out of town, like, with the kids. He was like, yeah, my uh, mom cheated on my dad with two men from church, and that's, like, what other time during the week do um, women get so dressed up and stuff to, like, go out and... He's like, the vast majority of the time, women don't like get dressed up even for you, blah, blah, blah. It's like, oh, you want to go to church? There's a Bible right there. You can worship in our own house. Like, I'm going to be there when you go to church. And it's like, bro, (laughs) you are traumatized. Calm down and go to therapy. Um, Okay, the idea of a woman like cheating on her husband with two guys at church feels like someone's fetish, right? Oh, yeah. It doesn't feel like a real story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to read number two, and then you're going to read the comment that you made under it, and so I don't get mixed up anymore. Um, he thinks about you when you're away and still thinks about you when you're near. Okay, so the rest of this list is, like, actually tangible things a guy can do, and this one seems really weird. Like, how does a woman know if her significant other thinks about them when they're away? Right? Like... I I would say it needs to be something more specific, like he makes it a point to check in on you regardless of proximity. I think a good way of figuring out if he's thinking about you when you're away slash when you're near him. um, I don't think near you. It's better, easier to fake it when he's near you. But I would say if he calls you or texts you when you're away, let's just say like you're on a business trip or something, he makes an effort to call you or text you and, um, I think that that's a good way. That would be my only proposal on how you would know, though. I think what you should do if you want to tell if your guy is thinking about you is to text him unprompted at random intervals. Would you still love me if I was a worm? Yeah, that's the only possible way. I don't know why I didn't think of that before. (laughs) (laughs) What's number three, Naomi? Uh, He changes all his phone numbers so that none of his old flames can contact him anymore. This is weird advice because it's like it takes two to tango it's not that his old flames are contacting him it's that someone needs to be receptive on both ends to cheating on the partner right so like it seems weird that he's putting all the onus on like the old flames being the ones initiating cheating um i understand okay maybe changing phone numbers but it's also like 
you still know the other person's number if you're intending to cheat. You can just jot it down on a piece of paper somewhere before you change your phone number and then contact them from a new number. This doesn't feel as applicable of advice. I get what he's saying, but I don't know. It it seems to put, once again, all the onus on women initiating cheating, men being completely blameless, and it's not really helpful in the grand scheme of things. If someone's going to cheat, they're going to go to extreme ends to make it happen. Yeah, it doesn't talk about how... um... Like, you can block some, like, he doesn't talk about, like, how you can block a phone number and how, like, the other person can still contact you because they still know your number. You know what I mean? Like, you can easily, there's easy ways around it. And it's... I, I This book is so old, I'm picturing Steve, like, only has a rotary phone. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, let me change my home phone number. No one will get me then. Number four, he allows you to help pick out his wardrobe. What the fuck? What does that have to do with anything? I I don't know what this helps with. The other advice I don't think is horrendous. I, I, it's only these first like four, but he could just be trying to get better fashion to help pick up other girls. Um, a lot of men don't know how to dress, and I don't think it's a matter of ego to let women in and help them dress better. So I don't know if this is like meant to be a test of like whether or not he's willing to help you. Yeah, this is just weird. It's strange. <laughs> Number five. Ooh, this is a good one. Any man who wears matching outfits is compl- is totally committed because he has lost all his friends' respect. Okay, let's talk about this. If I want to put my <laughs> man in a fucking tutu, he's going to fucking like it. Yeah, I mean... I think get better friends, but I do know, you know, a lot of guy groups are known, you know, they're notorious for razzing. Um, I, I think... Compared to the last piece of advice, this is a better example of like your ego being put on hold for the desires of your partner. I feel this is a better signifier. Is it perfect? No, but I do think it's important to be like, hey, if you're earnestly with someone who cares about you, they're willing to do things that maybe they're slightly uncomfortable with. They're willing to do things that make them look a little silly because they know that you're going to find it amusing and you two can have fun together. Yeah. Number six, he gives you a nickname he can't allow his friends to hear, like Schmoogles. Did I say that correctly? Trust me, he knows full well that as soon as his friends hear that, they'll know he's sprung. And through it's, and though it's your nickname, that's what they'll call him every time they see him. I need a cute nickname for Lauren. I think Schmoogles is good. Maybe I'm not committed. Schmoogles is pretty good. Yeah, I do like calling her the old Paul and Chain. The Paul and Chain. (laughs) Yeah. No, that's so good. Like, it's awful, but like, it's pretty good. I don't know how you came up with that. That was pretty good. Yeah. Number seven. He puts making you happy in front of his own happiness. I don't hate this. I mean, it could be toxic, but I think in a lot of examples, it can be positive. I can imagine, you know, Steve gives some examples later in this book. And I think like if a guy wants to go golfing with their friends, but, you know, you want to go shopping or you want to spend the day in and he's willing to like give that up because he knows you're important. That's fine. I mean, allow your significant other to go out golfing and spending time with friends. But like on occasion, it's totally fine if like you ask to be made a priority and expect that he make you a priority. Okay. Number Number eight. eight. He's seen you without your hair styled and no makeup and still keeps calling. Does he just think that women are just like fucking ugly at their core? No, I look, I was talking to Lauren about this yesterday. I think this is even bigger of a problem nowadays because you have all this like AI artwork and especially like AI porn that's coming out. And you have these women who have these like impossible hourglass figures and like the biggest boobs you've ever seen. And guys just go gaga for this. And I can't tell if they're like totally okay with AI art. And they're like, oh, this is really hot art that appeals to my interests. Or they just think that's what women look like. Because it certainly feels like a lot of guys can't distinguish between AI generated women who look unrealistic and real women. 
And I think this is also a problem when like every single movie on TV demonstrates, you know, people with perfect teeth and perfect skin and perfect hair at all times. You know, you have all these like shows like The Walking Dead set in the apocalypse where like women can't possibly have hairy armpits. They have to keep shaving them and things like that, which is just completely unrealistic. But I think like every piece of media we have presents this unrealistic view of like what people look like and what you can expect from a partner. And I think there's unfortunately a lot of guys out there who don't know exactly what they can expect. And so I'm not saying Steve is saying that women are naturally ugly. I'm saying men who have like a certain expectation of what women look like, who then see, Oh, this is, you know what women actually look like once the makeup's off, all the glosses off that that's something that, that that's a litmus test of sorts. Okay. Okay. Number nine. He's met your entire family and is still willing to attend the family reunion. You know what I always say? If there's not a crazy in your family, you're not looking hard enough. And if you still don't think there's anyone crazy in your family, you're the crazy one. Yeah. I I, I find this kind of funny because in the first Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man movie, there is a scene set at a family reunion And one of the main characters shows up and is like, I showed up rather than going to church with my mother because I love you. Now make me a damn sandwich with pickles, woman. It's great. Damn, I love a good sandwich with pickles, though. Yeah. Uh, Number 10. He knows your kids are crazy and ill-mannered, but loves you anyways. What? Yeah. No, I, I think that's good advice. I mean, this is kind of presuming that every single woman who's trying to get married following this advice already has kids which yeah don't necessarily think is accurate but um yeah i mean i think a lot of people have this expectation that you know kids are going to be perfectly behaved and you know not act like kids most of the time and that's unrealistic children are going to be dicks children are going to ruin evenings children's are going to you know do stuff break things that you care about um i think you know if you're going to find a partner who's fine with you having kids you need to find someone who's fine with your kids acting like jerks most of the time because that's what kids act like sorry true he's seen your mother in action and still thinks you can make it as a couple what does senior mother in action mean because i'm taking that as a little dirty (laughs) people can read this and get completely different things um uh, yeah that's interesting it's like uh He's seen how sexy your mom is and still hasn't broken up with you to date her. (laughs) Hot. I don't know. This is kind of weird because like Steve has made a point talk about like how you should always respect mothers. Like that's a major plot point and think like a man part two. how like one of the people needs to respect his mother, even though his mother has been like horrendous to his like future wife. Um, I guess what he's saying is that mothers can be kind of intense. Maybe this is specific to like the African-American community and his experience, but he's like, look, mothers can say ridiculous things. Mothers can you like be mean, but deep down, like they care about you. If you see a mother like acting crazy, Crazy, you need to be able to accept that okay and number yeah. 12 he allows you to meet his entire family realizing that that could change everything yeah i don't hate that do advice you know, um, okay but do you know how ahead. many men will go out of their way to be like oh yeah this is my new sugar honey boo boo bear and then go out and cheat on that same woman the, the same day because it doesn't mean much to them i don't <laughs> okay I don't know. Like, sure, sure. I, I don't think in a vacuum that's good advice, but I think this advice is meant to be applicable. Hmm. This advice is meant to be a series of things that are indicators, right? Like any one of these by itself does not mean the man is going to be committed. But once you start seeing more and more signifiers, more and more of these things being checked off the list, the likelihood goes up that that person is committed to you. Does that seem fair? Okay. I can see where you're coming from with that. Similar to the last time he brought up like a list of things that were like requirements for relationships. I think this is a good list, but like it's not specific enough. I think there's a lot of things that you could add on to it that are additional signifiers that, again, don't magically mean that a person's committed, but make it more likely. A couple of examples. I don't know if you can think of any is he talks about your future together unprompted. He buys things for the future, like house accessories, say like a new baby crib items for a vacation or wedding supplies. Um, He puts you on his holiday card every year. He wants to lie in bed with you and cuddle rather than always wanting sex. He accepts when you don't want to have sex and doesn't hold it against you. He lets you talk to friends and family when he's not in the room. 
indicating that he's not like trying to cover something up and hide something from you. He's not constantly questioning your whereabouts. He asks what's going on in your life, what you're focusing on at work, what you do for fun. I don't think these are exhaustive. And obviously, again, there will be exceptions. But yeah, I think it's weird that Steve is like, I need to write an entire new book to clarify some of the stuff he made and still gives advice that's like kind of a cursory look at any given topic once again. Yeah. Well, that's just Steve Harvey for you. That's just Steve Harvey. Again, Naomi, he has that third book coming out with the incredibly long title where he clarifies all of the clarifications. Well, Joel, I think this is a great place to wrap up. Um, Any last comments before I talk about our wonderful Patreon? I was surprised by this. I still have problems with what Steve is saying, but it certainly feels like there's more than one Steve saying things. Um, Definitely. It seems like there's another person who's come in and like had a chance to write a significant chunk of the book with like better advice and phrasing that isn't so condescending. Um, And I like that. I appreciate that. My problem here is that I don't like it when books are nuanced. I like it when they're either mostly good or mostly bad. Because, as I said, you know, there are people are going to read this and they're going to look at it and say, oh, this advice is really helpful. Therefore, the majority of advice in the book is helpful. And they're going to take the bits that are helpful and then take the bits that are unhelpful and be led down the wrong roads. Um, I I, I think it's unfortunate um, because, like, some people are going to pick this up and find a lot of value in it. And then they're going to pass that book on to other people. And they're going to have the expectation that those people follow the advice. And if those people don't follow the advice, again, they're going to blame them and think that they're stupid for not doing the things that Steve says you need to do, which are, by definition, not things you can prove either right or wrong. And so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm mad because, like, I want to just hate this book, but clearly there's some kernels of good advice here. And it's frustrating that I can't just be like, read only the highlighted sections, <laughs> dear readers. Chapter one, page three to five, then skip ten pages and move on to chapter four. Yeah, it doesn't work like that. Um, on the whole, I would say don't read this book, but it's probably better than a lot of dating advice books we've read on this podcast. It's not the worst thing you could consume such as life. Wow. What a great, I think we should take that as like part of the, what do you call those things on the back of the book that are like, this is the best book I've ever read. What do you call those? Doesn't suck. Joel guy. Yeah. Not the worst thing I've read. <laughs> Joel guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm reading The Art of Seduction right now, which is a follow-up to The 48 Laws of Power, and it is abysmal. It is a dredge. It is so onerous to get through, and I know already all of my arguments against it, and I'm just reading it to say that I have, like, done the legwork. Um, Yeah, it's better than that, at least. I'm reading, um, right now I'm reading This Is Your Brain on Birth Control, and I think that that, I I should, I should pass that along to more people, because Giselle actually passed that on to me, and I think it's a great book, and I think more people should read it, because it's not about, like, oh, this author is not saying by any means, um, you should be off of birth control and you should get off of it immediately. It's more of you should have more understanding of what's going into your body so that you can make your decisions with more, like, understanding of the topic because the vast majority of the time doctors will just be like you have cramps here's some birth control um and you can't make your decisions with your decisions about the medication that's going into your body because you don't know much about it wow that's really interesting Naomi. it'd be cool if we had a venue where you could discuss that book to our readers some way joel i'm uh... literally reading it for the podcast oh my (laughs) god (laughs) okay You know, I say that Steve Harvey, you know, unfairly gives people like crap who don't deserve crap. And here I am just berating my sister as always. It's great. Yeah. And all I do is love you. Anyways, um, I would like to mention before we end this episode that we do have a Patreon, but we also understand that um, the economy sucks right now. So if you can, please donate. Um, But if you can't, um, and obviously we understand that because the economy sucks right now. We would really appreciate it if you could leave us a review on one of our many um, streaming platforms that we stream our po- podcast on. Um, examples are iTunes, Spotify, um, scratch, scr- I'm, I'm missing all of them. Um, but yeah, leave us a review. If Google you could. podcast, really podcast Google addict. Podcast. Yes. Um, 
We'd really appreciate that. If not, we totally understand. Uh, I'm going to go uh, one step farther. Don't leave one review. Leave two? Uh, yeah, you said leave one on one of our podcast streaming platforms. Uh, I would say leave one on all of our podcast streaming Ooh, platforms. Ooh, okay. Um, Every so, single result. That would be awesome, but we also understand that people don't have time and the economy sucks and we love you for it. But um, we'd also like to mention that our Patreon has exclusive content and that's why we're pushing it. So if you want to watch this podcast in real time and watch all of my awful faces that I make while Joel reads me things the vast majority of the time, um, that would uh, that's part of our exclusive content. We film our podcast. So um, give um, us a like, subscribe. I'll caveat that. What? I'll caveat that um, I've been picking my nose most of the episodes, so you know maybe not this episode, but others, okay. others. <laughs> well, uh, we love you <laughs> and have a great week and uh, use a condom. Mm-hmm.